So, you absolutely destroyed that light goal. Way things are going, I'm probably going to end up bald before next year, but I've got to be unreasonable now. 30,000 likes before the next part of this story, which is the Neo Heroes arc in around a month from now, and I'll shave my head after that. This part here though, the Psychic Sisters arc, probably has some of the greatest moments from throughout the series. It's not necessarily on like the same destructive level that the previous Monster Associations arc was on, but it comedically had me curling over in pained laughter. Everything is just brilliant and I'm a glaze the goat Murata and one with this video so damn hard. This whole arc just feels like season 1 with how the pacing is and just the world breaking level of Saitama. Everything that comes his way is just played off like a complete joke. Of course, remember to subscribe if you are new around here and want content just like this but for a variety of different series. For now, time to sit back and enjoy the video. Kicking things back off, right outside a large apartment in the new Hero Association base, Butterfly DX, Forte and Chain and Toad decide to visit their new freak of a neighbour. They call out to him and ring his doorbell, thinking he might be a rookie they can outshine as more experienced heroes. To their surprise, the door swings open and King stands before them, instilling fear into the trio as they come to the realisation that Saitama isn't home at all. Elsewhere throughout the One Punch Man world and amidst the destroyed landscape of the previous battle site, a lone helicopter spots a certain hero. Down below and rummaging through a sea of rubble, Pig God is searching for something, confusing everyone in the helicopter. Close by, the weird meetup is spotted by Black S, who is currently hiding inside of the rubble. With all of the heroes in the helicopter yelling out to Pig God, telling him that he needs to rest, the S-Class hero decides to run off. Randomly, and of course Black S notices Pig God running in his direction, and hides to not be found. The representative, annoyed at the S-Class hero's self-centered nature, is then met by the A-Class hero, Ear, who claims he'll take the job of capturing Big Pig God. Claiming that all he needs is 5 minutes to finish off the wounded pig, Ear rushes forward. As he gets closer, the A-Class comments on the pathetic state of all of these so-called pillars. From what he's heard, they were all taken out by the hero hunter, they're spoiled and neglected their training. Getting up to the large hero, he demands that Pig God return back to the base or face him to gain his freedom. Overhearing what the dude's saying, the representative becomes anxious over how this happens every damn time with heroes. Suddenly, something moves amongst the rubble nearby. Revealing itself, the object turns out to be none other than a severely reduced evil natural water. Its appearance doesn't phase Ear, but stuns Pig God who knows of the monster's true capabilities. Ear then nonchalantly decides to deal with the little monster first and launches his boomerang, only for the demon level threat to shoot a beam of water that penetrates through the boomerang and Ear's throat with complete ease. Black S, who was hiding within a few feet of the group, sees the scuffle and is shocked to see that his fellow monster is still alive. Without hesitation, Pig God then quickly swallows evil natural water, seemingly ending the monster's existence. Randomly, a plethora of water beams then shoot out of Pig God in every direction. Concerned, the representative asks what the hell he just swallowed. However, Pig God explains that it's okay now because the monster is fully digested. The dude tries to get the S-Class hero to return and get examined by the docks, but he points out that the helicopter can't even hold him. Instead, he actually intends to visit a ramen shop. Walking off now, he points out that a survey of the area should probably be done to find any surviving monsters. Over with Black S and realizing that they are extremely low on cell stocks, he runs away deeper into the destroyed area and finds somewhere to hide. As he walks, he can't help but be shocked at the Monster Association's downfall. He continues his search for something to eat and gain a few extra lives when suddenly he sees Saitama in the distance. Saitama himself is overjoyed at the situation as after a few days of searching, he's finally found the remains of his destroyed apartment. Knowing that this man is he, Himothy, Black S hides in sheer terror. After everything, the last person he wanted to bump into was the naked man who knocked out the awakened Garrow with a single punch. To his horror, the duo's attention is moved towards the now much smaller overgrown rover. Looking down on the trio now, Black S is baffled that somehow Pochi survived. As he watches the monoliths of strength tower over the pup, he can only feel sorry for the poor thing and also realizes that it would be wise for him to leave. Bizarrely, and just before leaving, he sees Saitama stick his hand out and pick up Rover. He notices that, instead of instantly killing the monster, Saitama is treating Rover like an animal. Thinking about why a man of this strength wouldn't deal with the threat, he assumes that the dude is the sort of guy who probably avoids needless violence. Realizing that this could actually be his one chance at survival, Black Hair starts to fixate on what his next action should be. Meanwhile, Genos and Saitama are stuck in conversation over how long he's been a fan of dogs for, with the latter telling him that it's actually just a recent occurrence. 
Genos agrees that they are extremely cute, but before he can worry about the cost of feeding Rover, his watch beeps, letting him know that he's needed at the Hero Association. Still stuck in thought, Black S believes that even if the monsters come back, there's no safer place than under the protection of Saitama. Sucking up his pride, Black S eventually leaps out from behind the rubble and attempts to join the Bold King's group of Muppets. A little while later, Saitama is seen yelling at the newcomer, telling him to stop following him as, right now, he can barely take care of this dog, let alone some weird monkey thing. Black S speaks up and tries to convince him by saying that he'll help out with chores, but after Saitama begins to walk off, sticks with the idea of hiding low as his monkey. Wondering if the apartment even allowed pets in the first place, Saitama just assumes that he could put up a doghouse outside, exciting Black S. Questioning the cadre, Saitama asks if he's seen a one-eyed monster around these parts. Thinking that he possibly means Juro Juro, Black S just claims that it must have been taken out by one of Tatsumaki's larger attacks. Obviously, you know, he's not even talking about Juro Juro, he's talking about Monaco right there, which is quite funny, you know, the one-eyed monster. Miss good old Monaco man, I wish he'd pop back up into the story. Getting closer, Saitama points out that he can see it now, his new home. Blown away with the tremendous size, the little monster finally feels like this is a place he doesn't need to watch his back inside of. Meanwhile, inside of the Hero Association headquarters, a presentation is given to a select few rich members of the public about the new apartment complexes. Green and Crescent Eyebrow talk to each other about how it's obvious the association is targeting the rich first. Green knows that if money is able to buy safety, the recent influx of rich people who are willing to pay for it is increasing. Crescent points out that it's probably because monster attacks are on an unprecedented levels these days. Even disaster level demons pop up more than twice a month now. The presentation mentions that the apartments are impervious to monster attacks and only A-class heroes or above with a proven track record can live here as residents, while simultaneously being bodyguards. Taking in all of this speculative information, the crowd doesn't reciprocate the same feelings. They know that even if they're living with heroes, they're still human just like them and can be injured. They can easily wear themselves out or get caught up in an accident. That, in their eyes, certainly can't be called safety. Sensing the unease of how weak the human frame is, the presenter moves to a new topic, the Hero Apartment's secret weapon. Designed by Metal Knight and using an AI to anticipate, coordinate and execute the appropriate response, it is claimed by Metal Knight that this comprehensive defense system does a more effective job at defending the base than all of the A-class heroes combined. Cutting through all of the chatter, randomly, the base's alarm system detects something nearby and activates. Outside the headquarters, Saitama, Overgrown Rover, and Black S arrive at a large steel entrance door. The defense system, sensing the two monsters, calculates their strength and sends out a level 1 response. As the entrance door opens, a gigantic robot walks out and confronts the trio. Without hesitation, the robot attempts to annihilate the two monsters with a thundering left smash. Confused, Saitama blocks the attack, destroying the arm, before jumping up into the sky and completely shattering it with a simple slap. This in turn annihilates the level 1 defense system, causing the building's AI bot to readjust its calculations and send out a lot of level 4 robots. Just like before, the robots launch their attack, firing hundreds of blasts in the direction of the trio. Black S and Rover somehow manage to slip their way through the blasts, just before Saitama, who, you know, was completely unconcerned with the level increase, adjusted these stupid robots with a quick smack. Obviously, this completely destroys all of the robots and activates the entire base's defense system. Inside and freaking out over the current battle going on right next to an entrance, the Hero Association sends out an emergency call for several heroes to deal with the threat. Confusedly, they try and search for the exit inside of this new large complex. Eventually, they head towards the south and find the correct entrance doorway. However, as they rush outside, the representative sees Saitama and asks, what the hell just happened out here? Saitama tries to tell him that, well, they all just randomly exploded, but gets cut off when another one complains that these robots took 9 billion each to develop. Now terrified of dealing with the financial repercussions of his actions, Saitama weakly states that they all just simply exploded. Obviously, the officials don't believe him in the slightest and ask for every single detail possible on what just happened here. Cutting the representative off and backing up the bold king, a familiar voice tells him that he's telling the truth. Of course, it's no one other than King, who states that he saw it too. All these robots just randomly exploded. While all of the representatives are caught up on King's appearance, Saitama approaches his mate and gives him back his video game console, albeit completely broken. 
even though it was, you know, like him who actually broke it in the first place. Remember back when he got mad and I'm pretty sure it was when he got mad and he overclicked it too hard, breaking it. Now a man's trying to pass it off as damage from the recent battle. It's a, it's a genius move, but Saitama, he just, he just can't own up for his mistakes. It's so funny. On top of that, and curing his anxiety, King doesn't mind in the slightest and had only stopped by his apartment earlier to see if he wanted to jam out together. Watching nearby, Forte is surprised to see King talking with a complete nobody. As the hero wonders, like, who the hell he is, it's shown that after a lot of trials and tribulations, Saitama has now been promoted to A-Class rank 39. Over in the control room of the new headquarters, a few of the workers talk about how much money was poured into the design of this place. They think Metal Knight's done a sloppy job as, with his robots malfunctioning like that, it's thrown billions of taxpayer dollars down the drain. Of course, you know, they're talking about billions of yen, so it's like hundreds and hundreds of millions probably. One of the guys notes that he's going to share the image data from the security cameras with Bofoy, so he's interested to find out what excuse he's going to come up with this time. Somewhere else, in deep thought, Bofoy can't understand how level 4 through 10 of his robots were completely destroyed. What's more, the one who did it was a complete loser from the Hero Association. Class A, rank 39, caped baldy. Glancing over his data, he can see that within 65 days, Saitama, or as they know him, caped baldy, has risen through the ranks extremely quickly. That, it's actually wild when you think about how long this series has been going for for us, and since the time Saitama, you know, did his test, I guess, back in season one, it's been only 65 days. That blew my mind when I first read this. I like just the fact it's been like 10 years, hasn't it? Like at this point, it's got to have been. It's crazy. Anyway, anyway, moving forth, needing to source more information, the Bucktooth genius cracks into the association's database and discovers that Saitama has helped in a bunch of the most recent battles. Confused on why he was ranked up so quickly, he finds some hidden remarks about how early on, the man absolutely destroyed the physical test, becoming the new record holder for it. Seeing how easily he destroyed his robots, Bofoy judges that Saitama is probably stronger than even an S-Class hero and decides to track him just in case he becomes a future enemy. Hmm, I wonder what Bofoy's possibly got up his sleeve, eh? He's a bit cheeky it feels like. Is this the first time that we actually see Bofoy as well? I'm pretty sure that it, it properly is, I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure it is. Skipping back to two days ago in an emergency meeting held with only Genos, Flashy Flash, Sweet Mask, Zombie Man, Second Guy, and Sitch present, Big Sitch suggests that the recent events during the Monster Association incident are linked with the prophecy that the Earth is in danger. He asks that until they can confirm their official standing to keep all information confidential. Genos immediately agrees, but Zombie Man wonders why he even wants to keep things secret this late in the game. Flashy Flash thinks that they should remain cautious as even heroes have begun reporting that anybody at any moment can just transform into a monster. Already knowing this info, Sitch says that it's precisely because of this reason that they need to be certain about a way of fighting it before doing anything publicly. Sigingar points out that revealing this info too early could actually create a form of mass hysteria due to a widespread fear and anxiety over not knowing who might become the next threat. Having an extremely tight schedule, along with his pant, Sweet Mask asks for more information on what they already have, as he doesn't have a single clue what they're actually even talking about. Genos butts in with a stack of notes and remarks to the group that he needs to set aside exactly three hours to discuss Saitama's activities during the battle. Realizing that he probably needs to put Genos last, Sitch asks Zombie Man to discuss what was told to him during his battle against Homeless Emperor. Sitting there, Zombie Man mentions that while Homeless Emperor was still human, he was given a divine power by someone called God. Sitch, Sweet Mask, and Sigingar are surprised at the mention of God, while Genos and Flashy Flash, who weren't too surprised, state that he had previously encountered something that tried to offer power and spoke to him telepathically. This God stated to Sweet that if the vessel who took this power wasn't worthy, then they would face forfeiture. Zombie Man, who, you know, like fought Homeless Emperor, obviously, remembers and lets everyone know that in his final moments, Homeless Emperor seemed to be hearing someone or addressing someone in person. Flashy Flash takes this info and the stuff that was given to him by God and is able to figure out that what killed Homeless Emperor was probably the same being. Sweet Mask speaks up and proposes that this God might just be a leader of the Monster Association. After all, the so-called Juro turned out to be a human esper. Flashy denies this as, in his opinion, it would be weirder that only a select few cadre were granted this power out of the entire base. The enemies that they just faced wouldn't be strong enough to force Blast into chasing this thing through the shadows of space-time. Looking at Sitch now, Flashy asks for any info on what's actually going on with him. Not initially saying anything, 
Flashy reiterates what was told to him by Blast during the previous battle, causing Sitch to reveal that he has actually been helping keep Blast hidden. For the past 20 years, Blast has been continuously fighting against the one they call God. Blast, along with his intergalactic partners, had been searching for a mysterious cube that could turn humans into monsters. This cube was handed down over time as a kind of communication device that somewhat allowed an individual to communicate with God. Blast was specifically collecting these with his boys and trying to analyse them. However, two years ago, during the infamous battle in which Blast took on the Outer Centipede, he came into contact with God directly. Of course, like most other S-Class heroes who have been prompted by God, Blast refused the power and actually pitted himself against God. At that point in time, the association wasn't able to hold a candle against such an opponent, even with everyone working together. To start with, not a single sensor they've created has been able to detect the being. Once they realised that it would probably be safer to have everyone stay unaware of it, Blast took off into the expanse of time and tried his best to protect everyone. Flashy, stunned with the current information he's receiving, figured that the top ranking hero would have a good reason for not showing himself. Genos though, man thinks, you know, completely differently. Jumping into the conversation, he lets them know that if they had just spoken about it sooner, Saitama, aka Caped Baldy, could have resolved this already. Actually a goat for standing up for his man right here. Sitch tries to deny this rock solid information by explaining that only Blast is able to battle God because of space time manipulation ability. Laying his trap card on the table, Genos asks if that is indeed so. He after all wasn't able to fit this into his one page report, so instead has decided to bring a specific tactic up here that he knows will work. Beginning his long held off rant, the cyborg tells them each and every detail on what happened in the fight between Saitama and Garo, along with his own fate and that of all of the other heroes. After the gruelling 4 hour discussion comes to an end, with Sweet Mask leaving due to scheduling problems, everyone is exhausted. Still, they all claim that Genesis intel is pretty damn wild. Sekinga can't even fathom how it's possible for them to fly to Jupiter, destroy the entire planet, then fly back. Then, on top of that, the time travel just makes it all completely fly over their heads. Sitch mentions that if it is true, they must confer with Saitama for its authenticity. Yet, and like we already know, Genos remarks that Saitama has no memory of the events, leading Flashy Flash to call Genos' explanation a lie, enraging the cyborg. Zombie Man instead points out that they could confer with Garo and confirm it that way. Again though, Sekinga explains that the apparent shock from the final punch made him lose his memory from throughout the battle. With no definitive info at all, Sitch states that the one thing they can confirm is that the interactions with God's dimension is rapidly increasing. Blast assumed that it's possible there might be something in their world's dimension drawing him here. Either way, Sitch continues explaining that Blast will soon return and until then, their top priorities are unity and solidarity. Having completed their meeting, Genos abruptly leaves, saying that if they do hear anything from Blast, they need to contact Saitama, aka Mr. Caped Baldy, immediately. Still super cocky, Flashy tells Sitch to let Blast know that he needs to hurry up and finish his current fight so they can finally throw down before also leaving the place. Sitting there himself, Zombie Man suddenly remembers back to Dr. Genus's words about someone losing their hair in exchange for removing their limiter. Realising that it might have been the caped baldy, Zombie Man gets ready for the impending future. Down a nearby hallway, Flashy thought that up until now, caped baldy was positioned under Genos. After this meeting, and having seen the dude's intense devotion towards Saitama, it makes him think that it's possible he might be that guy. Elsewhere, and as Sweet Mask makes his way towards his next scheduled meeting, he can't help but think for Genos to be so captivated by Caped Baldy, he must have what it takes. What it takes to be the ideal hero. Being driven through a mountain road, Fabuki is asked by eyelashes, why on earth does she want to go to this place anyway? Looking actually banging right now, Fabuki replies that she plans to meet someone and there's a slight chance things will turn violent. Elsewhere in our city, Sweet Mask is approached by a director of a new upcoming idol group. This idol group, the Bubbly Boys, are a group of seven strong high school aged students, with two of them having already passed the C-Class Hero exam. Having explained this all to him, the director hopes that Sweet Mask will be able to give them some advice in surviving this cutthroat entertainment industry. Unconcerned with these pathetic nerds, Sweet tells them that they have zero appeal, none, so don't talk to him. He isn't interested in phonies. Instead, he's entirely fixated on looking at his phone. More specifically, the security camera footage from two days ago, which shows a caped baldy destroying the base's defences. 
After hearing harsh words from the hero that they've based their entire existence on, the members of the group start arguing with him to his annoyance. He tries explaining to the idiots that the title of hero isn't something that can be used as a stepping stone. That way of thinking is exactly what the agency is already saying that the group's difficult to handle. Wondering what they would do if Sweet was a monster and it appeared in front of them like this, the group claims that they'd lay him out at 7 on 1 and he shouldn't be looking down on them, the bubbly boys. Beginning to crack up laughing, without warning, the pathetic boys feel an overwhelming chill that startles them into silence. Sweet Mask explains that it's their instincts warning them of how they are too biologically different. Menacingly staring at them, he sternly lets them know how disgusting they truly are. None of them are beautiful. Beautiful like him, the caped baldy in all his overwhelming power. Speaking of the man himself, over inside his apartment, Saitama finally meets with and greets fellow A-Class heroes Chain and Toad, Butterfly DX and Forte. After finding out that Saitama is older than him, Forte claims that he is the senior of the apartment because he moved in first. Saitama however notes that the place only opened two weeks ago. Moving past the teething troubles, Saitama greets his new neighbour and tells him about how his place was recently destroyed. Yet, once he became A-Class and King told him about this shelter, he moved in. Randomly, Chain and Toad removes his furry hat to take a quick sip of the tea, then casually puts it back on. Confused, Saitama asks what the hell just happened? Big Butterfly explains that due to Chain and Toad being extremely plain of a person, he wasn't popular in the hero rankings. In an attempt to fix that, he started wearing the headgear to develop a sort of, you know, character. <laughs> Thanks to these smart tricks, he was able to become just slightly popular with the kids. When it comes to the bearer of this info, Butterfly DX, well, he assumes Saitama already knows of his skills, so there's no need to explain them. Yet, and to his complete confusion, Saitama notes that he doesn't have a clue who he is, but he is charmed. This physically breaks Butterfly, who claims that he's been on TV a lot, and is pretty famous online too. Strolling off, he tells them all to hold on just, just for a second. Bursting back into the room fully dressed in his hero uniform, he excitedly says that this is what he usually looks like. Still, Saitama has to explain to him that his place has only had public broadcast, so for the past two or three years, he's only watched Disaster and Weather Channels. Plus, for a semi-naked butterfly, Saitama finds him overtly hairy and asks him to not start shedding in his room. Next up, Forte introduces himself and says that he uses music, or more specifically, the rhythm, to help him fight in battle. On top of that, he remarks that they put him in a fashion magazine once, however, he doesn't even care about that. Saitama remains unimpressed though, wondering how working up a rhythm each time he fights even helps him. Annoyed with this, Forte screams out in anger and threatens Saitama to a fight outside. Leaving the room in preparation to throw down, Saitama looks down to notice that, just outside his door, Black S and Rover are there. Thinking that he should probably start setting up a doghouse, he all of a sudden has an even brighter idea. Then in a way to, you know, lighten his workload, Saitama proposes the plan of having the loser of his upcoming battle take care of these pets. Walking out themselves now, Forte notices the monkey looking thing and cruelly picks it up by his head's antenna. Butterfly can't help but notice the weird look of it as well, and wonders if it's a sort of monster. Hearing this, Blackies realises that he needs to continue pretending to be a monkey if he wants to survive. Having taken a look at these so-called pets, Forte agrees with Saitama's proposal of making the loser take care of them. Down in the association's parking lot now, Chain and Toad and Butterfly DX watch as the two A-class heroes begin to face off. Forte cockily tells his opponent that he might end up getting hurt, so no hard feelings either way bro, to which Saitama states the same thing and pleads for him to not beg to become his disciple once he wins. Chain and Toad notes that moving to a rhythm isn't a strange technique, even first rate martial artists learn to do this. However, if you dismiss Forte's unique fighting style that has been attained through countless battles as a performer, then that fool would be in for a world of pain. Activating his music, Forte begins showing off his unique style of fighting with rhythm. Randomly though, as he does this, Saitama tries screaming something out to him. Due to his headphones though, Forte doesn't hear it and is run down by a car that had just pulled into the parking lot. Quickly getting out of the car to check what the hell they just ran into, it's revealed to be the Blizzard group who were heading to this unknown location earlier. Noticing someone getting out of the car, Saitama makes sure to let her know to apologise to this random dude later on. Curious as to why Saitama is even at the Hero Association, Fubuki questions what the hell he's even doing here. Meanwhile, in an underground parking area, a mysterious person exits their dope ass fuck car and is welcomed by the Hero Association staff members. 
been in the vicinity, Fubuki senses that man's presence and tells Saitama to come with her. Turning around, she grants him permission to accompany them, the Fubuki group, into the association, confusing the hell out of Saitama. Grabbing his pants, Black S asks Saitama what they should do. Looking over and realizing that technically he has beaten Forte, hands over Black Sperm and Overgrown Rover to Butterfly DX before leaving with Fubuki and her group. Moving into the association's base now, the Fubuki group makes their way down to the special internment facility. Given the inmate's number they intend to visit to the receptionist, it's revealed to them that the inmate has already been visited by someone else. Following this meeting, they are being immediately transferred to another location. Due to this, the receptionist lets them know that they can't visit this person. However, with this being an emergency, Fubuki demands to be taken there straight away. Down on floor B13, the mysterious man is led to a gigantic jailing cell. Opening the door, the guard exclaims that it's perfectly safe as this person has been highly medicated. Inside, it's shown that the mastermind behind the monster association, Psychos, has been incapacitated and restrained. Making his way inside, this random dude says that according to what he was able to surveil during the previous battle, this woman was able to fight on even grounds with Tatsumaki. To their organization, she is an extremely valuable person with a few extraordinary abilities. He thanks the higher up members of the Hero Association for handing her over to them, to which it's revealed that they have already stripped her of all of her human rights and labeled her as a monster. They are now technically free to do whatever they please with her. After coming up to her, the man claims that Psychos is a sample that will greatly help in progressing the Tsukiyomi's research. Upon hearing the name Tsukiyomi, Psychos becomes slightly alert and uses her telekinesis to assault the man who also appears to be an esper and quickly blocks her attack. Figuring that the medication wasn't exactly the greatest, this dude launches a counter strike and renders her unconscious with one blast. Looking at her full limp, he stops his attack and notes that they cannot damage her precious brain. Inside it, of course, is the awed over third eye that they have heard so much about. An eye that allows one to take a glimpse into the future. One of the representatives asks if he should, you know, like, deal some more to her, as they, they have some fantastic facilities right here. Turning and revealing his true self now, this man exclaims that it's fine. They'll perform a very thorough examination on her once they get back to his lab. Meanwhile, and while taking a massive elevator that leads underground, Saitama and the Blizzard group head towards the mysterious man. While on their way there, Fubuki recalls her encounter with Psychos during the Monster Association incident. As they were about to battle, Fubuki addressed her as the former Vice President, Psychos of the Third Eye. She tried appealing to her human side and asked for the fellow Esper to surrender herself peacefully, otherwise it might harm her actual life. Spazzing out in pure anger over being told what to do by this absolute witch again, Psychos angrily said that Fubuki got desperate and sealed off her powers when they were students. Now, just when she was about to rise up and be the strongest in the world, she stands in front of her once again. Hearing this, Fubuki agrees and says that yes, she used to be a self-centered person. But back in the day when Psychos proposed the idea of humanity extermination while they were still in a group class called the Society for Supernatural Research, everyone hated that idea. Fubuki though, all she could think of was an overwhelming desire to pass her sister and stand on top of the world. If she completed that, there wouldn't be a need for anyone else at the top. Watching the high school Psychos more, Fuki came to hate who she was. She despised that she tried to steal her followers away from her. On that day, she realized that Psychos was her enemy, and enemies must be crushed. Screaming that this time, Fubuki will be crushed, Psychos spits a flurry of sharp stone objects down on the ground below. Somehow powering up on an unprecedented level that we haven't seen Fubuki at before, apart from maybe against, you know, Pochi, Fubuki is then seen flying up into the sky through the rubble and commencing a 1v1 battle against her old schoolmate. In a flashback, a young Psychos is seen telling Fubuki about the increased membership in their group and the invisible hand from a nearby town wanting to pick a fight with them. Over time, it's shown that the invisible hand instead offered to work underneath them. Wondering if she's actually getting stronger herself, Psychos commends Fubuki for having powers that dwarf her already strong abilities. Psychos at this point was actually only able to lift a single human, while Fubuki was able to lift an entire 18-wheel truck. Later in a library, Psychos is seen sudden a new ability called the Third Eye that allows her to see into the future. With this ability, she thinks that she might be able to predict the future just like the great prophet Shibabawa. On top of that, it might allow her and Fubuki to finally overthrow her evil older sister. However, the future Psychos then sees drives her insane, to a point she can't even seem to understand that this, this is the future she will go into. 
mentally insane now. The next day at school, the overwhelming pain of his future caused her to scream out that all of their future plans are pointless. Explaining it all to Fubuki, she instead proposed the idea of destroying everyone. That way, at least the whole human race will be able to start over and it won't become the disaster it's certain to be. Back to the moment where they were confronting each other during the Monster Association incident, an already weakened Psychos was defeated and captured by Fubuki, who wanted to know the source of her madness. It's actually crazy to think that somehow Fubuki managed to capture the person that was putting her sister, like pushing her sister to the limit. Uh, I, I don't understand it. Either way, either way. What was it that she saw in the future? Catching the falling Psychos in her arms, Fubuki wonders what changed her. She was never a tough person. Placing her hand on her old friend's head, she senses a mysterious presence floating above them that sent chills down her spine. Back in the present, the Blizzard group and Saitama finally arrive at Psychos' internment unit just as she is about to be taken away by that random man. Fubuki informs everyone present that the visitation is over and they need to evacuate the room immediately. Due to the information about Psychos being moved, and if Tatsumaki ends up finding out about it, she'll come in and finish her off immediately. Instantly following that warning, the roof above Fubuki is destroyed and Tatsumaki drops into the room to finish her job. Pointing her finger down and questioning why she's alive, Tatsumaki attempts to bury Psychos in rubble. Luckily, Fubuki is able to react in time, managing to put an energy orb around Psychos. Seeing the random try and attack her, Tatsumaki, with just like a complete glance, sends the random dude shooting into the wall nearby. Fubuki then screams for all of the representatives to escape back to the surface and commands her guys to start attacking her sister. Getting ready to send a blast in her sister's direction, it suddenly skips back in time to a dinner date between the two. There, Tatsumaki explained that the same guys who captured her when she was younger are now after Psychos. Even though she's a monster, Tatsumaki finds it immoral to hand her over to anyone from that group. Instead, she actually plans to work in combination with Fubuki while making it look like they aren't even together. Skipping back to the fight, the random Esper, who managed to survive Tatsumaki's blow, gets back up and knocks out the fleeing representatives, then destroys the room's cameras. Slowly powering up, he expresses a desire to make all three of the girls into souvenirs. As all of the Espers begin powering up, sending rubble flying, Saitama tries butting in. All he came here to do was actually complain to Tatsumaki for destroying his apartment, but it's obvious now that she doesn't have a sorry bone in her body. While pretending to hold off her sister, Fubuki remarks that she's lucky Saitama joined her. She knows he has a great strength within him and is even playing dumb, purposefully not realizing that he defeated Garo. Saitama tries to say that he honestly doesn't remember, but it's not like she was even listening to him in the first place. She fought Garo too, and it was obvious that he was someone who had reached his peak and then ascended it. If Saitama did truly take him down, then he must have ascended as well. Fubuki, she gave up on being the strongest a long time ago, and because of that, she can make the distinction between those who are and aren't ascended. Due to the powerful psychic clash between Tatsumaki and the man from Tsukuyomi, the ground beneath Saitama violently cracks open and he falls down to the floor below, much to Fubuki's shock. Down on an even lower level now of the association, Saitama confronts many, like hundreds of demon level beings who have been detained there. Laying there, he wonders, what the hell this part of the base even is? Noticing that the base is keeping monsters as pets, he takes this information and presumes that it's probably sweet to have a dog or two in his apartment. Elsewhere, it's revealed that this month inside of the world of One Punch Man has had an all-time high of monster disasters. A random rich girl in a date notes that if tons more of these monsters keep appearing, then people might not be able to go outside. The bloke though, he knows he's safe. The higher ranking heroes all protect this area. They have an even higher level security than any upscale neighborhood. The facilities the association provides are on par if not better than any other place and they've got even more planned. There isn't any annoying traffic and it might even become the capital one day. Hearing all of this quells the girl's fears of death. However, after she places her tea down, notices that it's shaking. Feeling what surely isn't an earthquake, the dude denies all thoughts of it as this facility is constructed with state-of-the-art earthquake restraints. As it seems to come to a stop, a sudden clash between Tatsumaki and the mysterious dude creates a powerful earthquake that knocks the rich people off their feet. Over in the control center, hell is literally breaking loose as they try and quickly discover the location of this shaking. Noticing that it's coming from the experimental monster floor, the man in charge screams out to get some heroes down there. Back in the battle between Espers and noticing that he's still at a slight disadvantage, Tatsumaki mocks him, asking if the poor little guinea pig ever thought he stood a chance. 
Getting distracted for a moment, Tatsumaki notices her sister fainting after trying to reopen the hole in the floor. In actuality though, it's revealed that previously before coming here, this random dude had implanted a sleeping tablet in Fubuki's daily supplements. Taking her hostage now, he threatens to break the deadly poison one he put inside of her next if Tatsumaki comes any closer. Enraged but still able to think on the spot, Tatsumaki realizes that there's most likely a spy in the manufacturer of the base or someone in her sister's group. Complimenting her listening skills, the male Esper demands that Tatsumaki not resist. Joking that he needs to make her slightly easier to carry, Tatsumaki is suddenly forced into a binding of psychic power. While holding her down, he explains that the Espers are a defective species that need to go extinct. Throwing up his other hand, the dude proceeds to open the containment cage of the demon level monsters that are kept on the floor beneath them. He explains that no one would care if both of these sisters died due to Tatsumaki's rage unleashing all of these monsters here. Emerging from the Fubuki group, the spy then jumps up and flies off to make his leave with this mysterious man. As the plasma field holding back the monsters begins to disappear, all of the weak Fubuki members try and close the door, but it just won't work. With a terrifying screech, all of the demon level monsters slowly begin emerging from the floor below. Randomly though, all of the monsters explode and Saitama bursts through the floor's entrance, surprising everyone. Getting slightly distracted for a moment, Tatsumaki manages to find a way free and breaks through the mental restraints put on her body. Instantly following this, the Tsukuyomi member attempts to activate the poison pill inside of Fubuki, though to no avail, instead it's shown that Tatsumaki, within milliseconds of receiving her power back, had managed to find and neutralize that pill. She managed to do this by copying the wavelength of her opponent's Esper's telekinetic signals and turning the pill into a needle thinner than a strand of hair. Following this, Tatsumaki pulls the needle out of Fubuki's body and then directs it towards her enemy's face. Throwing up his hands to stop it, the Tsukuyomi member can do nothing as it pierces through his hands and stabs directly into his right eye. Noticing that he somehow didn't die from the attack, Tatsumaki menacingly threatens him as she intends to wring his body until all information on the Tsukuyomi group is revealed. Using her psychic abilities, Tatsumaki collapses the complete room in on this dude and captures him inside a huge boulder-sized asteroid. The spy desperately tries to flee the scene, but Tatsumaki glances in his direction and sends him crashing into a nearby wall, knocking him out. With the Tsukuyomi members defeated and their situation solved, the Blizzard group rushes to their leader. Tatsumaki furiously demands that they shut their goddamn mouths and scolds the entire group, including Fubuki. She demands that her younger sister breaks all ties with them, that we use to take advantage of her and they just got lucky this time. In all reality, Tatsumaki knows that she can't protect them all and needs to split her sister away from them. Showing the love that they have for their leader, the Fubuki group demands to know why. If they at least explain it to them, then maybe they can figure out a countermeasure. Enraged with their defiance, Tatsumaki sternly tells them that it's because of their stupidity their leader's life was put in danger. Fubuki doesn't need them anymore and in her eyes, all of them are just a nuisance. If they don't decide to leave now, then Tatsumaki threatens that she'll make sure they can never work again. Fubuki screams out for her sister to stop, however, the one to grab the Esper's hand and put a stop to this complete rage fest was no one other than the Bald King. Asking what the hell he's doing, Saitama tells her that the two sisters are just like each other. This, this is going too far just to lecture someone. In another place, Air suddenly awakens in the Hero Association Hospital. Speaking up, Forte, who was, you know, obviously also put in hospital, says that he doesn't need to worry, he's perfectly safe here. According to what he's heard, Air had let his guard down for a moment and was taken out by a random monster. Wondering who he actually is, Forte introduces himself to Air as the A rank number 31 hero and someone who's at higher rank than him, so they should probably just get along. Forte himself notes that he probably actually isn't in the best state to judge someone right now and still can't even comprehend how his opponent took him down. Feeling something on his neck himself and noticing the change in his voice, a random doctor lets Air know that the damage he received in battle was severe. To fix him, they had to surgically augment his voice box with some mechanics. The doctors claim that they're specialists in cyborg science and were requested personally by the association to help out with Air. Seeing that, you know, he's being ignored here, Butterfly DX asks Forte what's getting him so riled up, it's not like he should be taking out his anger on others to start with. Not listening to him, Forte just goes on a fat rant about how once he leaves here, he's going to get revenge on that douchebag named Saitama or something. That guy acted like a dumbass, but turned out to be one tricky genius with an abnormal ability. Forte asks his boys if they all saw it as well. Saitama was right there in front of him, then randomly out of absolutely nowhere, he was assaulted by an attack that sent him straight to hospital. 
On top of that, his ankle was broken and he has a crazy ass whiplash. It's almost as if he was hit by a car. Getting close to him, both of four days boys let him know that it was a car, bro. Plus, he probably should stop using headphones during battle as the guy, you know, he was, he was just trying to help him out. Realizing how freaking stupid he is now, Forte asks them to forget about everything he just said. He'd honestly thought he was just like Tatsumaki and was the owner of some cheat level psychic abilities. Twitch, hearing that, Butterfly remarks that if it was her, he'd definitely be dead. <laughs> Bringing the trio back to reality, Forte wonders what the hell the shaking was earlier. Knowing some of the information, Butterfly Dex says that it was some monsters in the jailhouse going rampant, but we'll go and source some more info while he's resting here. Meanwhile, and after having her hand grabbed by the big man himself, Tatsumaki asks if he's deaf or something, as she just told him to let go. Saitama replies that he's just trying to get her to calm the actual hell down, causing the esper to throw Saitama through the association's base. Looking at the force being exerted on him, Saitama wonders if this was the same ability that sent Genos flying, and tells Tatsumaki that right now, she's no different power-wise from Fubuki. Fubuki, having heard this, screams out in horror, not wanting Saitama to enrage her sister anymore. Just straight up pissed now, Tatsumaki screams for him to let go and begins trying to twist the bald man's body. Much to the surprise of the S-Class hero, Saitama is able to endure her attack, making her question what in the world's different about him. Chilling in his own strength dimension, Saitama starts to notice a subtle twitch in his muscles, making Fubuki think that he's easily able to withstand her sister's full power. Getting up close to him now, Tatsumaki remarks that she thought she'd seen him somewhere before. He's the baldy who's always chilling with the demon cyborg. Confused as to why he's here now, she asks if he's a part of the Fubuki group as well. Unconcerned for the child trying to escape his grasp, Saitama yells out for Fubuki to quickly evacuate everyone out of here before her sister accidentally kills them. Seeing how cute Saitama is with Fubuki, Tatsumaki, with a look I'm sure I've never even seen before, questions if that's the true reason as to why he's here now. Taking this question as like what he means exactly to Fubuki, Saitama says that it's not like he's her mate, or companion, or even close friend, you know, he's just simply an acquaintance of hers. Hearing this news sparks a flame within the heart of Fubuki and drops her to the floor completely unconscious. Looking hella devious herself, Tatsumaki asks why he'd get so desperate just over a simple acquaintance. Either way, in her eyes, she needs to test his strength levels to find out if he truly deserves to be hanging all over Fubuki like that, which is absolutely crazy, man. One Omurati, you guys are nuts for chucking that in there. I laughed so damn hard when I first saw that part. This whole part of the video, like, so far is just unrealistically funny, and it just gets even better as we go. Like, each part is even better and better and better. I don't get it, man. It's unreal, like, how continuously funny it is. Every situation Saitama is in is, like, half serious and just not at all. <laughs> Like even here, he gets exactly what she's saying and even gets repulsed at the idea of it. Instead, he exclaims that it's hers. She's the one dragging him around all the damn time and just being a total pain. <laughs> God, I love the look of like the starry-eyed Fubuki in the background just glaring at him. <laughs> anyways, anyways, amping herself up, the surroundings all begin warping and twisting to the power increase in Tatsumaki's psychic outputs. Above, all of the residents begin freaking out over this apparent brand new building already suffering some damning issues. In the control room, Gaspur yells out that the elevator to get to the lower floors broke. The other dude notes that some of the clients were in visitation with one of the prisoners, along with a select few heroes who have also been trapped down there. As the basement starts twisting even more, slowly reaching the point where everyone might be crushed, Saitama tells Tatsumaki to stop tracing people like trash. Instead, and to keep everyone safe, he grabs and pulls her in close to his chest, causing the Esper to feel some sort of way, before forcefully jumping towards this guy, taking Tatsumaki with him. Looking up through the gaping hole that they just jumped through, Fubuki notes that it has begun. Saitama versus Tatsumaki. Above them, the electric dude, can't even remember his name right now, I think it's Lightning Max, yells down noticing the people there and calls over to some other heroes to head down through this new gaping hole. Elsewhere in the maze that is this new hero association base, Tongue Stretcher, Wolf Bear Ballet, and Man Eating Capybara manage to escape from their holding cell. Having made their way to what they think is a random room, the three goons burst in expecting to find a few pathetic humans they can eat. Instead, they find that it's not exactly weak humans, almost every single A-class hero is situated in this room, hiding for some reason. Dumbfounded with their luck, the monsters instantly close the door and make a run for it. Elsewhere, at the exact same time, a random family is seen travelling towards their new condo at the Hero Association headquarters. 
knowing that the recent influx of monsters isn't going to stop anytime soon. The father notes that the 35 year loan is a small price to pay for them to live in peace. Unable to even fathom how long 35 years is, the son just begins getting hyped up over the thought of receiving signatures from his like favourite heroes once they arrive. Suddenly, a glint of light pierces through the afternoon sky, confusing the father who can't even see what it is. Of course, that sparkle in the sky was none other than Saitama and Tatsumaki who end up crashing and bouncing along the ground next to the highway. Tatsumaki confusedly asks what the hell Saitama's up to before launching his body into a violent spin. Whipping the cape body down, she slams him into the ground, however, Saitama's grip holds firm upon her arm. A flustered, Tatsumaki accuses Saitama of being into her, but Saitama corrects her by stating that he just doesn't really want her to run away and destroy more homes. Hearing him say run once more makes Tatsumaki explode in anger, as in her mind why the hell would she run away from someone weaker than her? Letting her hand go now, Tatsumaki instantly changes her mood and even acknowledges Saitama's strength, saying that it isn't half bad. Pulling her hand up to his forehead, she increases her psychic output just slightly before flicking the caped body, sending him flying back into a pile of rubble. Looking up, Saitama notices that Tatsumaki has completely lost it and activated her signature tornado move. While everyone realizes that the two guys have escaped, the Sukiyomi members find their vehicle and boost past the guards towards their freedom. Heavily wounded and seemingly, you know, safe now, the spy asks if Mr. Apollo was alright. Looking in the side mirror though, he quickly realizes that directly behind them, Tatsumaki is already outside. Seething with anger, Apollo eerily comments that the next time he sees her, she will be his. Over in the battle, Tatsumaki hurls a boulder directly at Saitama, yet he easily deflects it. Upping her attack potency, Tatsumaki sends a barrage of boulders towards him. Inside the control center of the Hero Association base, a bunch of low-class workers relay in horror that they've detected abnormal vibrations approximately two kilometers away from the base. Overhearing the commotion and knowing that Metal Knight is still unreachable, an overseeing advisor asks for them to begin assessing the disaster level. Based off the minimal information he's heard, the advisor guesses that they probably need an S-class hero and asks if anyone can be immobilized immediately. Outdoors, you know, that random family who's trying to make their way to their new condo, start hitting probably the fattest straight line drifts I've ever seen. Man is bringing back the Saudi Drift King out from out of freaking nowhere. Looking through his binoculars and somehow still sitting in his seat while his dad is doing the craziest maneuvers, the kid notices the amazing S-Class hero Tatsumaki fighting a mysterious opponent. Of course, the dude flashing from rock to rock is none other than the bald legend. The father, who somewhat realizes how insanely dangerous of a situation this is right now, remarks that they should probably get away from here fast. The kid though, who's wanting so bad to smoke a family pack, begs for his father to get in closer as he can almost hear her voice. Suddenly, a massive boulder is sent barreling towards the car. Luckily, Saitama manages to save the family by destroying it in time. Annoyed, he screams out to Tatsumaki that she needs to pay attention on what's going on around her. Asking him why he's acting so damn pompous, Tatsumaki swells her energy up and sends another flurry of boulders while screaming that she knows what she's doing. Seeing the attack heading his way and figuring that she's probably not in the greatest of moods, Saitama comes to the conclusion that, for now, he'll keep her company in the desert where no buildings or people are, then eventually she'll wear herself out. Having not paid enough attention though, our dude accidentally deflects one of Tatsumaki's attacks into the direction of that same family. Vanishing from sight in an attempt to stop his own deflection, the car is then saved by the small esper and pulled up into the sky with her abilities. Instantly, she turns the situation on Saitama and jokes that he needs to pay more attention when deflecting things. Furious, he asks the dumbass midget what the hell she just said to him. Literally vein popping with rage, Tatsumaki screams that she's going to turn the pathetic baldy into a vial of farming fertilizer. Dropping the car to the ground and leaving the family absolutely fretted with what they just went through, the psychotic Esper reactivates her terrible tornado ability and begins sending even more pieces of rubble in the direction of our now fleeing Baldy. Curious as to why he's even fleeing now, she charismatically jokes that this is pathetic, there is no way she'd ever be able to entrust Fabuki to someone like him. Telling him that he needs to leave and get the hell away from her, Saitama scoffs at just how bizarre this has all become but thinks all he wants to do right now is go home. With his motivation plummeting, Tatsumaki launches a psychic attack that blows off Saitama's jacket. Not done, she follows up and sends forth a blast that manages to knock the caped body off his feet. Flying across a random parking lot, Saitama is then hit by another few energy attacks that send him hurling miles across the barren landscape towards the closest city. Meanwhile, back in the Hero Association headquarters and realizing that now with Tatsumaki making her intentions clear, there's no possible way to keep her group together. 
approaching her with their heads down, the Fubuki group all apologised to their leader for being unable to do anything in the previous battle. They claim that, if given another chance, they will never make their mistake again. All she needs to do is advise them on what to do about Sukiyomi now. Unconcerned for these weaklings, Fubuki just tells them she's done. From today, the Fubuki group is disbanded because everyone else was too useless. Standing there, like stunned mullets, all the group is able to do is watch as Fubuki flies up into the sky, telling them to leave and not follow her. Meanwhile, in N-City, the A-Class hero Feather is beaten and heavily injured by a group of random foes. One of the gang members joked that he went a bit wild for a bit and did manage to take a few of their guys down. However, with the injuries Feather's taken in the process, there's no way he can fight any longer. Turns out, Feather had only battled this notorious Iron Fist gang with the intentions of freeing a female hostage. Hmm. Calling him an idiot for getting fooled, they ask the hero for any final words, only for the hero to ask about this random girl's safety. Scoffing at just how mentally deficient this hero is, the underling screams out for Erika to show herself. Turns out that Feather already knew this chick, I wonder how many chicks he knows, and was actually being fooled by her. She was never his woman, instead, Big Iron, the boss of the Iron Fist is her man. Stunned and unable to take in this cruel piece of information, Feather can only listen as Erica explains about the first time she was sent out as a decoy to distract him from finding the gang. She thanks him for being so dumb he couldn't pick up on her terrible acting. From the moment he met her while crying, she could see the intent on his face to fix the situation. He truly is a model hero, yet she could barely even keep herself from laughing. Laughing himself now, Feather notes that she is indeed right, she is one of the worst actors he's ever met. As tears then suddenly begin dropping from her eyes, Big Iron, the man, barges onto the scene and questions as to why they're having so much trouble with a singular rat. Seeing that he's already on the verge of collapse, Big Iron threatens to finish the A-Class off with a single shot. Slowly rising to his feet and mentioning that this is perfect, with no hostage, it means that he can fully let loose. He yells out and demands that Erika watch this. This, this here will be his climax as a hero. What the fuck did I just say? Remixing the entire scuffle, Feather is all of a sudden taken out by a flying caped baldy who uncontrollably smashed through the wall behind him. Looking at the burly boys all standing in front of him, Saitama on all fours quickly apologizes for the damage but asks for them to send the bill to the lady behind him. Looking over and seeing a bunch of guys on the ground, he yells out that someone should probably call an ambulance for them as everyone here is in terrible shape. Jumping up into the cutout that Saitama made when he entered the building, the baldy tells her that it's dangerous to blast him through a building. Tatsumaki though is just like, bruh, you're the one who ended up blasting through it. Whipping his head back and forth between each party because he doesn't know where to talk to or who to talk to or who to address, the baldy screams that it's her fault for launching him through the sky. The group themselves all just stand there, sweating in fear, as they know that standing behind the baldy, the number two hero, Tatsumaki, the tornado of terror, has entered their building. Instantly, the boss of the gang assumes Feather broke his promise and called the heroes out here. Screaming out, he tells his men that a single S-Class hero isn't strong enough to contend with them. Saitama tries telling him to chill, but the boss, you know, pounds down upon the A-Class hero's head, only to instantly be counterattacked by one of Saitama's basic punches. Having watched their boss get sent into the stratosphere, Saitama nonchalantly asks who these guys are even meant to be. Rushing forth, all of the Iron Fist gang attempt to exact revenge for their boss. However, Tatsumaki demands that they all shut it. Her and him are already in the middle of a little something. A little while later, we see that those dastardly Iron Fist members have all been taken care of and Feather has regained consciousness. Erika mentions that the S-Classes vanished just like a storm in the night after dealing with the enemies. Slowly making his own approach, Feather tries to tell her that he was never tricked. Instead, it's probably best they forget everything about the past so that now she can be free like she wanted to. Unconcerned for Feather, Erika mentions that the one who saved her was Tatsumaki and she needs to send a letter of appreciation. Staring into the distance, Feather knows that everything is now resolved, but he feels as if he was hit by a car. <laughs> Knowing that he said this fight was going to be his climax, Feather makes the decision to return home and cry himself to sleep in an attempt to forget this day ever happened. Meanwhile, in H-City, an emergency evacuation is sounding, letting all of the civilians know about a nearby monster that has suddenly appeared. After recent considerations, this monster's disaster level has been adjusted from demon to dragon. The warning recommends that all personnel evacuate the entirety of H-City, but pleads with them to remain calm in these trying times. As seen from the chopper above, the disaster level dragon monster, Kenzen Rat, is continuing its destructive rampage. 
So far, the eastern portion of H City is almost completely destroyed. If this keeps up, then human civilization could possibly be in danger. At least, that's exactly how it feels if you're on the ground, situated like a reporter. It's also been reported that all police, firefighters, and heroes who were in the area have been completely wiped out. Coming in to save the day though, it's been heavily reported through online forums that the GOAT, S-Class hero, Metal Bat, is on the verge of making his appearance in H-City. Cheering for her brother to make it there in time, we flash over to see a sweaty Metal Bat boosting it towards the monster and complaining about how he's going to miss out on his precious cat having kittens. Just because how is it even possible he's the only S-Class hero available right now? Metal notes that if something happens to his cat, he'll legit murk a random civilian. Sliding into the monster's line of sight, Metal calls out to it and complains that because of this damn thing arriving, all transport was shut down and he's already had to run a freaking marathon just to get here. However, before he even has the opportunity to exact revenge on this rat, Kenzin is simply headshot and killed as collateral damage in the battle between Saitama and Tatsumaki. Screaming that he's a stubborn loser, Tatsumaki proceeds to throw Saitama through another three buildings. Coming to a stop at the other side, Saitama tells the Esper just to relax man, like the whole reason for coming out here to start with was to prevent damage. Metal Bat, having stood there and watched this entire altercation and just not in the mood after sprinting all the way to this scene, decides to turn around and go back home. Man wants to watch his kittens. Remember how Sweet Mask was over at that uh, meeting shunning the bubbly boys or whatever? Well, turns out that the three buildings Tatsumaki threw Saitama through were directly opposite the building Mask was in. Noticing how far they have gone from their original location, Saitama suggests to Tatsumaki that both of them head back. Tatsumaki at first seems cooperative, dropping down and agreeing with him, but after he points out the direction they should travel, she proceeds to grab Saitama by his clean, shiny, bald head and leads him back to their original location by running his head into the ground at the same time. Looking back while being dragged, Saitama points out that there's something behind them. Breaking into an inner monologue, Tatsumaki knows that if this thing behind them is able to keep up with them, it must be a monster or some sort of hero. Turns out the fiend behind them was the bald banging legend, Speedo Sound Sonic, who for some reason had a feeling that the man being treated like a ragdoll was none other than Saitama. Unconcerned for the previous scuffle, Speed throws a bunch of his weapons forth in an attempt to finally end his rival's life. These special ninja shuriken, they've actually been specifically engineered into a homing version that will track its target, then explode. Noticing them, Tatsumaki nonchalantly redirects all of his shuriken back at the ninja, catching him completely by surprise. In an instant, he begins dodging each of his own attacks, yet he fails to notice a nearby dog pooping on the floor and accidentally steps in it. Losing his balance, speed... <laughs> Fuck me man, losing his balance, speed curses Saitama while simultaneously getting hit by his own exploding shurikens. After seeing that they're now back at their initial location, Saitama breaks loose from Tatsumaki's grip, astonishing her with his speed, before telling her that she can feel free to rampage here. Annoyed at him for looking down on her once more, Tatsumaki clarifies that she is actually the one testing Saitama, and claims she should go all out and put him in his place. Literally chilling with his hand in his pocket, Saitama then tells her to go all out on him, which once again surprises her. Back inside of the Hero Association headquarters, many frustrated members of the Blizzard group quit being heroes after Fubuki's decision to break up their group. This is just mainly because to them, this group made them feel a part of something bigger and stronger. Now, with no leader here, they lack any direction and aren't strong enough themselves to compete with stronger heroes. However, Eyelashes isn't done and even manages to motivate a few loyal remaining members to follow him as he starts climbing towards the surface in an attempt to find Fubuki. Up on the surface, Fubuki witnesses tornadoes along with a multitude of differing sized boulders smashing into and devastating the landscape due to Tatsumaki's increased psychic output. She screams out to her sister that this, this is too much and she needs to stop but is quickly forgotten about as Tatsumaki beams Saitama through the sky. Over in the new base, King is seen at the entrance of Saitama's apartment and is panicking due to the surrounding catastrophe. Wondering where Saitama could possibly be at a time like this, our bald prophet suddenly shows up crashing into the wall and telling King that he's currently too busy to play fighting games with him because he's dealing with someone. Curious as to who he's fighting, King inquires only to find out that it's this little pimp squeak called Tatsumaki or something. <laughs> Having heard Saitama make fun of her, Tatsumaki then dives straight in for a kick but misses and instead crashes into the wall as well. Of course, King, who just happened to be standing there and watching this, catches a glimpse of Tatsumaki's underwear, stunning him. Not wanting to give his composure away, King just stands there, looking composed and ready for anything as Tatsumaki then glides back towards the bald man. 
As the intense showdown continues to evolve, it sends even more tremors in the direction of the Hero Association. Forte and Ear, having you know like felt the tremors, wonder what the hell is going on. Looking out the window and scaring the absolute life out of Forte, Saitama crashes into the wall just above his room. Confused, he inquires as to why he's out here, prompting Saitama to ask him about how his injuries are healing. Continuing to tell the young hero to stay in bed, the caped baldy leaps from the side of the building back towards the midst of destruction. After seeing the destruction that his fellow A-Class hero left to join, Forte decides to wait a while before his rematch with him. After arriving at the surface themselves, the remnants of the Blizzard group is left gobsmacked after seeing just how out of control Tatsumaki is. They know that if they want to stick with Fubuki though, they need to be marked by this beast. Swooping in over the C-Class heroes, Tatsumaki knows that she ended up miscalculating the outputted power of her limit's limit. To start with, she was meant to be testing this guy, yet it's all flipped up on its head now. Up until now in her life, there has never truly been an opponent that was able to take her head on, apart from obviously Blast. In her actuality, she was enjoying this battle, as before it, she assumed that the only person capable of standing against her was Blast, like I just said. Needing to bring this pointless show of strength to an end, Tatsumaki begins tearing up the ground and contorting all of the rubble into two large waves that clash into each other. Upon forming a tunnel-like structure, the Esper then collapses it upon the ant-sized man underneath. Not even a fraction of a second later, Saitama performs an effortlessly unharmed swing, throwing his arm up and dispersing all of the rubble around him. Dropping to the ground exhausted due to the psychic output of that attack, Saitama jokes that she really didn't need to go and push herself that far, and she's to have enough strength to talk with him at the end of the day. Snapping at him, the Esper catches Saitama in an orb of her psychic energy. However, he's so damn heavy that she's barely able to even pick him up off the floor. Asking why she's looking so grumpy, Saitama reiterates that he isn't her enemy. Like he mentioned before, it's just she views the lives of human relationships too lightly. For example, right now she's been stopped by the power of Fubuki's mere acquaintance. Hearing those words, and after failing to send Saitama into space, Tatsumaki loses consciousness from overusing her power. Dropping to her knees, she starts to remember how Blast told her that she shouldn't ever expect someone to come and save her. Moments after Blast had saved her in the past, Tatsumaki immediately reunited with Fubuki in order to protect her. After noticing that she was being followed by four Sukiyomi members, Tatsumaki disposed of them before once again asking Fubuki to come with her. The shock of witnessing her sister's violent acts caused the five-year-old Fubuki to awaken her psychic power and push Tatsumaki away. As this self-reflection of hers continues, she comes to see that it was her that dragged Fubuki to a harsh fate. Because of that, she now feels like she has the responsibility to protect her without relying on anyone else. Actually crazy when you think about it, the reason behind Tatsumaki wanting to constantly protect her sister was because she was the reason she developed powers in the first place and now feels responsible for people like possibly coming after her and stuff. Awakening in a bright place, Tatsumaki sees Blast standing in the distance. Walking up to him, she asks if this is where he's been all along. Seeing him leave though, she can't help but run after him and plead for him not to leave. Throughout the story so far, the only one to set Tatsumaki free was Blast. Due to this, she grew an obsessive, excessive expectation of Blast. She sought respect from the one that freed her and needed someone to guide her on a better road. Catching up to him now, Tatsumaki just says that she tried really hard, but nothing ever works out. She doesn't want everyone to hate and be afraid of her, but if they aren't, then things will just end up how they were before. Standing there with tears in her eyes, she questions the top-ranking hero about what she should do, when suddenly, an even brighter beam of light begins cutting its way into this already glistening realm. Of course, she was just waking up, and above her was the gleaming bald king, Saitama, looking down and asking if she was actually okay. Saitama praises Tatsumaki's abilities and pats her on the head while stating that if Tatsumaki can rampage without destroying other people's stuff, then she would make a great hero. As Saitama turns to leave, Fubuki arrives and tells Tatsumaki she is separated from her group like she asked. Joking that she likes the new attitude but it doesn't seem as if her own group understands yet, Fubuki turns around to see all of her loyal members running up behind her. Seeing Tatsumaki glaring at a lot of them, eyelashes along with a few other members garner up the courage to ask if she'll allow them to work below Fubuki. Done with these mice, Tatsumaki raises her hand to annihilate them. However, it's Fubuki who jumps in front and attacks her own men with a Hellstorm Blast. Knowing that they came back here to confront Tatsumaki, Fubuki questions what the hell they can even do when they can't even fend off a drastically weaker psychic power. 
actually confused with what the fuck is going on right now. Saitama and Tatsumaki just stand there watching the most neurodivergent C-class scuffle they've ever seen. Questioning why Tatsumaki doesn't just let them all go, she just yaps back that it's, it's none of his concern. Not listening, Saitama continues that back while he was job training, he wasn't even able to beat a wolf level threat before starting proper muscle training. Right now, Fubuki's team is all pathetically weak. However, he thinks there is truly no telling what their limits may be. Agreeing with the statement, Tatsumaki tears her younger sister away and explains that originally she came here to deal with Psychos. In the end, she overused too much power on a random battle and because of that has decided to let everyone off the hook for today, on Saitama's request. Turning and glaring at the group, she exclaims that if anything does happen to her sister, then she will never forgive them. After hearing them all agree, she finally turns to Saitama and tells him that this test of theirs isn't exactly over. At any time, whenever she may feel like it, she might show up and surprise him with another test. Suffering a level of depression not yet reached by man, Saitama disagrees as that's the last damn thing he currently wants. Still nearby and having listened, Fubuki is left blown away that her sister actually followed his orders. Moments later, Saitama tells Tatsumaki to chill out and not destroy anything else before finally making his way back to his house. Shooting up into the sky, we see that after the intense battle has come to an end and the landscape was destroyed, apart from one minor hole in the base, the entire association itself remained unscathed. Having made the long walk of shame home, Saitama enters his apartment and comes to the conclusion that he needs to get a new pair of shoes and some clothes. Upon looking up though, he just like previously discovers that three A-class heroes, Forte, Butterfly DX and Chain and Toad are waiting for him. Wondering what the hell they're doing here now, Butterfly perks up and lets him know that Forte has something to say. Apologizing for their first meeting, Forte legit starts glazing Saitama, asking if he needs any new clothes and if he didn't mind, he could bring some old sets around for him. Creeped out with his sudden switch up, Forte tries to say that it's because they're all A-class buddies and he's just trying to be friendly with them. Sensing the awkwardness, the group makes their leave. Still, Forte tells Saitama that if anything does bother him, come and let him know. After the trio of heroes departed from Saitama's apartment, Butterfly DX expresses bewilderment over Forte's abrupt change, questioning if the car knocked a different personality into him. Knowing a greater secret though, Forte disclosed that he witnessed Saitama fighting while at the hospital. Compared to them, his movements were out of this world, and he honestly doubts all three of them would even last 10 seconds against him in a true fight. Telling him to relax, Forte continues elaborating on how those previous earthquakes weren't caused by monsters. It was the impact from his fighting. Turning and pointing out the pet, he states that they better look after them and do their best to get Saitama on their side. At the demon level, monster containment level, three A-class heroes, Stinger, Lightning Max and Blue arrive to investigate the situation. After inspecting the mess, Lightning Max assumes that most of the monsters on this floor were wiped out by each other. Blue, who was also investigating, couldn't come to a solid conclusion on why the association would take such risks containing a bunch of dangerous monsters below them. The Fubuki group though try to explain to them that it wasn't a monster fight and instead it was a single A-class hero who took them all out. Asking if they all just saw something or are they dumb or something, they reiterate that they, they aren't, they're telling the truth. In the meantime, the other Fubuki members confront the executives of the Hero Association and accuse them of definitely knowing something about Tsukuyomi. Instead of fessing up, the executives explain that they just happened to have some spare time and wanted to check the area out. Realizing that they probably fell for a cruel shame, Gespe explains to the people around that Tsukuyomi is the name of a secret society. The only reason he even knows of it is because there is an urban legend about them inside of the psychic gossip circles. However, he thinks that it's all just a complete farce. Instead, it makes more sense for the surviving members of the Monster Association to come back and kidnap their leader under the guise of some new group. With everyone somewhat agreeing with his statement here, Mr. Fubuki calls out to Mr. McCoy, one of the executives, to have a chat about something. Entering another room, Fubuki confronts McCoy and asks him what the hell he's planning here. If it wasn't for her, all of the members of her group would have been turned into monster food. Fessing up, McCoy goes on to detail that they've been kidnapping monsters here for a top secret weapon that is currently being designed by Metal Bat. Wanting more info though, Fubuki raises a document and asks what in the world this massive sum of money paid to the association was then. Sweating balls all of a sudden over being found out, Fubuki's genius hacker notes that the lines of code he has are probably some of the worst he's ever seen. Fubuki even jokes that it would be such a scandal for the world to find out about this news. 
Immediately, Mr. McCoy drops his act and asks what it is Fubuki actually wants. With a grin of pleasure, Fubuki goes on to lay out her devious plan. Pretty much, she wants to take all of the monsters that have died, turn the cams off, and lay them out on the surface. That way, Tatsumaki's rampage can be marked off as both her fighting against the demon level threats, plus, if they manage to fix both of those issues at once, all of the rich folk will gain some trust back in the security of their house and this structure here. Starting to cackle, Mr. <laughs> Mr. McCoy agrees with Fubuki's proposal, and Tatsumaki subsequently brought all of the monster remains to the surface as part of the agreement. However, this actually turned out to be a ruse in itself, as the remains had a special someone implanted inside of them. Pulling up next to a clump of monster flesh, Fubuki uses her abilities to tear her old friend out into the car. Following this, the group steps on the gas and accomplishes the original goal they set out to achieve. Which, you know, was obviously going and getting Psychos from the Hero Association base, and they did achieve their goal in the end. Simultaneously, the news broadcast of the incident brought Tatsumaki into the spotlight, as apparently she repelled all of these monsters by herself. All of the city, literally everyone except one man, was overjoyed for this massive feat. Of course, Saitama and subsequently his boy, Genos, think this is complete crap. Genos even gets on the phone to file a major complaint with the Hero Association immediately. In the aftermath of this incident, the Hero Association soon discovered that Psychos had actually gone missing. Apparently, she was able to escape through a hole in the floor or ceiling of a parking lot. Being called there to answer for this, Tatsumaki feigned responsibility and began searching for this missing Esper. Obviously, you know, she made up a bunch of lies about her having the ability to use her psychic powers to track her psychic wavelengths and everything. Anyway, anyway, watching her leave with a grin on his face, Mr. McCoy calls out to her saying that he didn't realise she could be oh so remorseful. It's almost as if she's been strangely kind to them. Turning and looking more cooked than ever, Tatsumaki leaves saying that it's just some days she happens to be in a good mood. Meanwhile, Child Emperor, who thought the incident was kind of sussy to start with, did a little digging. After a little hacking into the uh, Hero Association base, he quickly came to see that the entire incident was nothing but fraud and cover-ups. And that there brings us to the very end of the Psychic Sisters arc. Obviously, there's a lot going on in this arc. We had Tatsumaki versus Saitama, which is the main part of it. But, you know, they didn't even really, you know, have a proper battle or anything. No one was properly mad at each other. Even Tatsumaki was having fun throughout their battle, as it kind of like alluded to right at the end of it and stuff. It's really cool to see Saitama finally getting recognition for his strength because he actually deserves it. You know, he's done so much throughout the series, even though it doesn't say it on his report card like Mr. Bofoy discovered, he has done so much for like the people in this base and stuff. And it's finally cool seeing people discover that this random bold dude is insanely strong and like all of the S-Class heroes fawning over his strength, especially Sweet Mask seeing him and being like, man, and like you can't stop looking at his phone. I love that. It was just hilarious. It drove me mad. Oh, just the, the dating part of this art. There was so much good stuff. I'd love to know all of your favorite moments down in the comment section below because this was, for a short art, a banging one, a banging one. And I can't wait to get into the Neo Heroes arc. So like I mentioned at the start of the video as well, push this video to 30,000 likes, which is an insane amount that I've never asked for apart from when I asked for 50,000 in the last one but i don't ever think that'll be achievable so 30,000 likes in the next month and if we somehow get that on this video then i guess we'll be going bold by the time we probably uh put out the neo hero arcs video which uh will be pretty interesting i think that's just an introduction arc so it doesn't have too much obviously i haven't read it yet i always stop at the parts that i record and then read more you know as i script it and stuff because i don't want to spoil myself and you know i enjoy series and i don't want to like hop out of the enjoyment factor of them by reading ahead too far and then being like i don't want to go back and do this so all this stuff to me is always so enjoyable when it's recent like yeah either way enough of me rambling enough of me rambling obviously if you are new around here make sure you hit the subscribe button and if you do want to get these videos extra early like a day or two early before i do post them up on youtube then make sure to check out my patreon which i will leave down in the description below thank you to all of the people who do support me over there it's just you know it's absolutely amazing getting the little extra cash to help out with editors and all that kind of stuff so and it really really truly does help with videos so Thank you so much for all of those guys over there. Either way though, for now it's been your professional degenerate Diavolo and I will see you all in a bit. Bye.